Let us now wrap up our module on task level parallelism by talking about a very interesting observation that was made about 50 years ago that is now referred to as Amdahl's law because it was made by Jean Amdahl. And the basic problem is this. What if your boss comes to you and say, we want to buy a new parallel computer? How many cores should it have? How many processors should it have? Well, one thing you can do is look at the applications that uh, your boss needs to run or you need to run in your company and say, you know that the speed up is going to be bounded by the work divided by the span. So it would not make sense to get more uh, processors uh, than that. However, what if you don't have a computation graph? Because these definitions of work and span came from the computation graph. Uh, and yet you want to make a reasonable estimate. Well, this is where Gene Amdahl's insight came in. He said, uh, let's assume that Q is the fraction of your application or workload that is sequential. And in that case, he uh, proposed that the maximum speed up is going to be bounded over by 1 over Q. Um, now, the interesting uh, thing about this is it's a very simple observation. If Q was 50% or 0.5, it says that the speed up will be less than equal to 2. So intuitively, if half your uh, application runs sequentially, the best case speed up you can get, no matter how many cores you have, is a factor of 2. And you would advise your bo uh, boss for that kind of workload to not bother getting a large parallel computer. If Q was 0 0.1, the speed up will be at most 10, because 10% 10 of your workload is going to be sequential. So this is actually a very useful rule of thumb to use uh, in engineering when trying to figure out how to provision a system for a given workload. Now, how can we prove this observation by Gene Amdahl using what we've learned so far? Well, um, if Q is the fraction of the work uh, that's sequential, I'm going to make the claim that span must be at least Q times work. So the idea over here is that we don't know the computation graph, so we're not going to explicitly compute the span or the critical path length. But we know that a fraction Q is sequential. So the product of Q and work must be included in uh, any path through the computation graph, and in particular must be included uh, in the longest path of the computation graph. So th that's why the span is greater than or equal to Q times work. Now if we have that, we can use the identity that we already have, which is an inequality that says speed up less than or equal to work divided by span. And putting these two together, we get speed up less than or equal to work divided by Q times work, which is, means it's less than or equal to 1 over Q. So it's actually very easy to prove Amdahl's law using what you've learned. And in fact, the bound that you have a work over span is a much more precise bound that takes into account the entire computation graph, uh, but can also lead you to the conclusion uh, for Amdahl's law. So what you see is that uh, by reasoning about the parallelism in a program and also the sequential part of the program, we can come up with a bound on the speed up. And uh, this idea is used very commonly. It's quite common in parallel computing for people uh, designing hardware or software to talk about an Amdahl's law bottleneck. What they mean is that there's some part of the computation that's being done inherently sequentially, so that is going to limit the speed up. So when you design your parallel algor algorithms, watch out for it. 
even if 10% uh, of your code was doing initialization or finalization sequentially, that's going to limit the amount of parallelism you're going to get. So good luck with designing parallel algorithms that have no Amdahl's law bottleneck at all.